hi all right it's been a couple of uh, it's been over a month for the path work and I'm I'm back baby take care of the puppy please all right here we go this is um, lecture number 20 and I've been trying to read this to you for over a month and I'm sorry I have to wear my glasses because I can't see so it's lecture 20 and it's God the creation Greetings in the name of the Lord. Blessed are all of you. Blessed is this hour, my dear friends. Most of you believe that when I hold a lecture that I freely and arbitrarily choose the subject myself on my own authority. But this is not quite so. I think it will be interesting for you to hear once a little bit how a subject is chosen and what is done in the spirit world about your little community. In the first place, you must understand that as a counterpart for your community on earth, which is little by little growing larger, there exists a considerably greater community in the spirit world, which governs everything pertaining to your community. This organization in the spirit world is helping, guiding, and deciding many factors you know nothing about, but still in connection with all of you on a much wider scope than any of you realize. There is not the slightest coincidence, not even as far as people are concerned, who come here once and do not stay because they lack either the spiritual maturity to understand what is going on or because they do not want to develop spiritually and walk this path of perfection for which a continuous supply of spiritual food is necessary. At the beginning, more people who fall into this category are coming here. But as I said, this is not a mere coincidence. There is a purpose and a reason for this, and I can only touch on these reasons ever so briefly now. Uh, until the friends belonging to the inner circle who actively help to build this community have proven themselves sufficiently in many of their weaknesses, the presence of people who cannot as yet fully appreciate this communication with God's world is a test for them. Every test and trial results directly or indirectly from one's own imperfection, and its purpose must inevitably also be to learn from it and thus to strengthen the individual weakness. You who belong to the inner circle have a great responsibility, and therefore you must become strong. And this can only be accomplished through all sorts of happenings, even seemingly unimportant and apparently coincidental ones. He who really walks the path actively and with open eyes will observe and test everything that happens to him in the course of the day so that he may further learn about himself. In the measure as you spiritually and emotionally grow stronger and lighter and more perfect, not only your personal conflicts will diminish, but the character and the spiritual development of most people joining your group will change. So, you see, it is not mere chance that always at the beginning, the majority of people coming to you are not of the caliber you may desire. Hmm. But you have noticed that this has begun to change already, and it will change even more as time goes on. And at the same time, people who fall under the category and approach, and approach you at the beginning of such a community are not guided here at random either. They may have certain merits from previous lives or the same life for that matter through which they deserve a special help and guidance to enable them to progress spiritually farther and faster. Mm. But it must be left always according to law, to their own free will, to accept or reject that help. Mm. Nevertheless, the chance should be extended to them. If they grasp it, it means a great victory for them and thus for the world of God. If they do not, the rejection serves the good purpose of necessary testing and learning for those people who have strong arms and shoulders, spiritually speaking, in order to be worthy of the great fulfillment awaiting them. So, there is no coincidence. Not one of you has come here just by coincidence, even though you yourself may think so. And it appears to you like that. By chance you have heard of this and have come here. And you come here of the experience or even out of curiosity. And yet there is a lot more to it than that. Others who might have come for the same reasons that you have come to begin with never hear of it and never have an opportunity. All this is determined by the organization in the spirit world that governs you. Who should be chosen? Who should be bypassed? At least at this time. Particular spirits whose task it is and who are trained for this work are being sent out to scout. 
to consider all pertaining factors of the individuals in question, and if it shows, in a case, that a person should join you, should at least be given a chance, then these spirits get in touch with the respective guardian spirits who guide their prodigies to someone else in your circle, and who inspire that person to perhaps propose the idea of joining your group. This will give you a vague idea how much work and care is involved, even concerning the smallest details. Also, the choice of the subject of the lectures necessitates a considerable amount of work in the spirit world. The appropriate subject at the appropriate time is not always easy to determine, and I personally could not possibly do this alone. You have not the vaguest idea what a world of order and organization God's spirit world is. The F excuse me, the efficiency of the spirits trained expertly for their particular tasks. The teamwork involved is something that surpasses your comprehension. For instance, there are a number of more exalted spirits above me in the scale whom I have to consult for the selection of a subject, for the advice given to certain individuals as well as various other other decisions. On the other hand, these spirits also take my opinions, my experiences, and my advice into consideration. And I have a number of helpers whom I am sending out or who are helping with other tasks in connection with the building of your community. From all these reports coming in from spirits involved with this work, a commission, let us call it, then decides finally on each subject, each subject and how far I may go in answering certain questions that may come up unexpectedly. And these decisions are made on the basis of a great number of factors involved where all the pertaining laws are to be considered. And it is sort of bookkeeping work, if I may call it that for lack of a better expression, where painstakingly, painstakingly many details have to be considered and weighed. So you have no idea how much work there is involved in our world regarding this community of yours and how much there has to be considered and also concerning the future and how difficult it is to determine that certain information given too soon could be may be harmful for some of the listeners and readers, while the same information may be useful for, their, for others, for their progress, in other words. So to find ways and means to further the progress of each individual belonging to your own group or just by the right amount of spiritual food at the right time, and at the same time to plan ahead wisely for the future of this group as a whole. So you and your world are so blind. You only recognize what is right in front of your eyes. You do not realize that often a truth heard too soon can be more harmful than heard too late. Yes, my friend, this is so. On the other hand, for other people, it may be of imperative importance to hear a particular truth or a spiritual law at a particular time. And in such cases, this information to be given has to be worded in such a way that it will not be understood by those not ready and mature yet. Uh, yet. This may give you the vaguest idea of your counterpart organization in the spirit world, which is deeply involved with many details you ignore completely, which is working with love, care, and wisdom to guide everything to the best advantage to all concerned. Also, for those you do not even know as yet and who will join you in the future to compute all this data demands trained experts, unceasing effort, foresight, and the thorough knowledge of divine law in all of its workings, as well as a great devotion to God. And the plan, the plan of salvation for the growth of the community in its proper way is imperative. It's, excuse me, is of imperative importance in the plan and of deeper significance than most of you sense. And with this, with, excuse me, and with these explanations, you may understand that what first appeared to you like a chain reaction of coincidences is nothing else but a great guidance put in action. Thus, you may also grasp that the inner picture of each person coming here has been taken into account up to the smallest details, and that not only the subjects of the great general, excuse me, of the general lectures are determined by all these details put together, but also the how of certain explanations, how a certain subject is treated. You will understand that I do not come here and freely choose a subject. Whenever a man has succeeded to be in contact with God's world, it never happens in such a way because too much has to be considered and is at stake of which you know nothing. I have said last time that I will talk about the fall of the angels in order to do this effectively that you may understand as much as any human being is capable of understanding. I have to discuss it in this order. God, the creation, the fall of angels, the plan of salvation, 
even though I can only touch on these subjects in the briefest, most condensed way. You will readily understand that I cannot possibly fit all of this into one lecture. And it may take perhaps two or three or even four lectures altogether. And in my last lecture, I have made a beginning with an explanation about the spirit of Jesus Christ, which is an integral part of these subjects. You will see how many lectures it will take to cover the above mentioned subjects. I will condense it first in the briefest possible form and may later on add certain supplementary factors. Of course, I will have to mention a few things that have been discussed already in the past and that my older friends already know. And this is unavo un unavoidable, not only because of those friends for whom it will be new, but also because it will give an overall picture in a consecutive way. And I do not wish to stress, I do wish to stress most emphatically that this touches the greatest questions in existence. And therefore, it is most difficult to present it in such a way that it can be somehow grasped even by those who are spiritually advanced. Thus, you should not try to, to absorb what you hear with your limited intellect alone. This would not get you anywhere, but you should try to listen with your heart. Listen with your heart, with your soul, with your innermost senses so that you may feel the truth rather than understand it intellectually. Only this will give you real understanding. Or, rather, it may be the material with which to lay the seed for enlightenment. Furthermore, I would like to request you, my friends, not to ask any questions pertaining to the subject before this series is over, because many of the questions you may want to ask in connection with it will answer themselves when I will have finished with this subject for the time, for this time. But I would like to suggest to you that you note your questions, whatever it is that may occur to you in the meantime, when I have finished, you regard these questions again, whatever has not been satisfactorily answered to you, whatever it is not clear, you may ask afterwards. So I will begin about God. What can I possibly tell you about God, my friends? He, I'm going to say he, is so great that it is something that can never be put into words and particularly for a human being. It is impossible to sense, to perceive, let alone to know what God is. I only want to say this much about the Creator. God is personality as well as principle. Human religions and human philosophies have not always debated this question. One opinion holds that God is a person. The other holds that God is not of substance. God is principle and force only. And as I said already, both are true. God in his male aspect is creator as such a person. The male aspect is the creative one, not only with God, but originating from him as a principle in the universe and with all beings. And in this capacity, decisions, dispositions, determinations can be made. In this capacity, God as creator, as personality, created the universe with all its laws, created other beings, although the latter in conjunction with the divine although the latter in, in conjunction with the divine female aspect. When it is being said that God created his children in his image, it is meant, it is meant divine feel, excuse me, can you, can I go back? In this capacity, God as creator, as personality, created the universe with all its laws and created other beings although the latter in conjunction with the divine female aspect, aspect. When it is being said that God created his children in his image, it is meant that all divine aspects reoccur in lesser degrees with these created beings. Thus the creative ability exists also to some, extent, to some extent in every being. Okay, so I am going to reread this entire section again because it's complicated. So this is the spirit guide speaking. This isn't me speaking. So I will begin about God. When can I possibly, what, what, what can I possibly tell you about God, my friends? He is so great that it is something that can never be put into words. And particularly for a human being, it is impossible to sense, to perceive, let alone to know what God is. I only want to say this much about the creator. I only want to say this much about the creator. God is personality as well as principle. Human religions, human philosophies have always debated this question. One opinion holds that God is a person. The other holds God is not of substance. 
God is principle and force only. As I said already, both are true. God in his male aspect is creator as such a person. The male aspect is the creative one, not only with God, but originating from him as a principle in the universe with all beings. And in this capacity, decisions, dispositions, determinations can be made. In this capacity, God as creator, as personality, created the universe with all its laws and created other beings, although the latter in conjunction with the divine fem female aspect. In conjunction with divine female aspect. This is important. When it is being said that God created his children in his image, it is meant that all divine aspects recur in lesser degree with these created beings. Thus, the creative ability exists also, to some extent, in every being. We have creative ability like God. This is kind of cool. Thus, divine substance, which God has to, has to a maximum degree, which Christ has to a lesser degree, yet to a greater degree than all other creatures, can best be described as a fluid substance of the most radiant matter that is imaginable. And it is the life force that it is the life force. God as well, as all creatures in their highest form of development can, so to say, dissolve this substance, these fluids, so that the compact personality becomes a flow, a principle, a divine stream, which does not mean the annihilation of individuality as a thinking being capable of making decisions. In this state, the divine fem female aspect is prevalent. It is the state of being, the state of slow growth and organic building. Whenever God wills it so, the fluids may be retracted so that his male aspect becomes prevalent again. Thus, the same holds true for all created beings in their highest state of development. If their female aspect is prevalent, they merge with God in a state of being. With their male aspect, with their male aspect prevalent, they help in the creation according to the will of God, to divine law. And I realize that all of this is impossible for you to really understand. It may be just a beginning for for profounder insights to come. Even the highest spirits cannot grasp, cannot fully grasp the love, the wisdom, and the perfection of God and the infinite variety of his creation. We can only stand in awe and rejoice and praise him. As I said in my last lecture, God put forth as his creation the spirit of Jesus Christ. As I said above, most of this divine substance is in Christ. Therefore, some religions refer to God and the Father God, the Son. You can see that there is truth in all of it. Although it is an error that it is one and the same person. After that, many other creatures come into existence. So many that you cannot count them with the numbers you have available in your world. Once I have been asked, why did God create all beings? For he, being all-knowing, must have realized that misery may result from it. And this is such a very important question that goes so deep that I would like to touch briefly on the subject. God is love and love must share. God is love and love must share. And this is the nature of love. Of course, God realized that all created beings with free will, they may decide with this free will in such a way that misery may come into existence, at least temporarily. Nevertheless, this is just the greatness of God. He created beings who could choose freely with the power endowed to them. They either would have the wisdom of not abusing their power and living within the perfection of divine law in a state of eternal bliss, or should they decide otherwise, they would finally come to comprehend all the better the perfection of divine law about their having gone through the valley of death and thus be more godlike than ever afterwards. The temporary misery for those who might decide wrongly is nothing compared to the bliss and the happiness of eternity after the self-inflicted misery has been gone through. The scales show this is so clearly that a spirit does not even have to be very high in development to recognize this fact. So God created many beings and many worlds long before a material world existed. Worlds of harmony, happiness, infinite beauty, infinite possibility to unfold creative divine aspects for all beings. Here, the divine substance of each created being was freely active, uncovered by foreign, ungodlike matter. And I have often said that you, that it is your task to uncover this divine substance, to free it of these God-opposed layers, which rob you of your unity with yourself and with God. And this divine substance is also referred to as man's higher self or divine spark. 
This is divine in every respect and possesses, and possesses some of that divinity. It is also referred to at times as the Holy Ghost, although this expression has caused a great deal of misunderstanding among human beings. The Holy Ghost is not one being, nor is it a part of the threefold God in the sense it is often interpreted. It is simply the divine substance that every living creature has to some degree and to some extent, freed of all other substances, or it is still more covered by other substances. So you can see that the idea of the Trinity has often been misunderstood, yet there is also a great amount of truth under the misunderstanding. Now, you will want to know how these foreign layers came to cover that divine substance that each being originally was. Mm. Okay, and this is the subject of the fall of the angels. Another name for those pure godlike beings or holy ghosts is angels. But before I go into that, I would like to mention that it is a great mistake to assume that this divine substance existing in everyone is God or identical with God the Creator. God is a being. What you have in you is of divine substance and has many of the divine attributes, although it is not to the same extent as God himself. It is God-like, and only this purified, freed substance within you is capable of uniting with God, of being one with God. No God, -like, no God unlike substance, can unite with him. It is error equal to the one cited before to confuse the godlike substance in each created being with that of the creator himself. Man often advances the idea that God should not have endowed his creatures with free will, for then the fall could never have happened, or at least God should have interfered when it is all started. But this is short-sighted, so blind. Happiness can only exist for any created being to be in union with God. And to be in union with God, you must be the, of the same substance, endowed with the same aspects and qualities. Otherwise, a union is impossible. Even chemically, this is so. Since God is freedom, and freedom is one of the most important divine aspects, God's creations must have this same freedom. That otherwise, they would be ungodlike, and thus incapable of being in union with him. And this freedom or free will and free choice entails perforce perforce the possibility to, rec to direct that free will contrary to divine law. In the, right free, in the right free choice, in the abstaining from abuse of power, lies divinity. Let me read that again. In the right free choice, and the abstaining from abuse of po power, lies divinity, lies love and wisdom, and a number of further divine attributes. attributes. It is of utmost importance for all of you to grasp this idea. For then you will be able to answer many questions that you may not have understood so far. God has also put into creation an infinite number of laws, and these laws provided beforehand for the possibility to return to God if and when any of the created beings should misuse his power and freedom. These laws work in cycles, which have to close whenever which have to close. Whatever happens, these cycles follow their stream. And the laws work in such a way that ultimately everything that once turned from God away from divine law will come back. The greater the distance from God, the more misery. For only in God and with God lies happiness. But just through this misery, the incentive arises all the stronger to return to God. This thought, too, lends itself very well for deep meditation. By grasping some of this truth, you may come to understand many things so far hidden from you. If your eyes, your inner senses will be purified enough, you will recognize this law even in your daily lives, even in your small incidences. So, spirit worlds existed for a very, very, very long time where all created beings lived in a state of bliss as you cannot imagine. For all creatures, the possibility existed ever since their coming into existence to choose freely to live to either live within divine law or to act against it. At one time, one spirit fell under this temptation. Symbolically, you explain this in the story of Adam and Eve in paradise. Actually, this happened in a very different way, although the idea was there. Perhaps you can comprehend some of this when you imagine that you ha may have a great power. You may know that to use this power in a certain way might be dangerous for you. And as long as this power is not exploited, you may feel a curiosity as to what would actually happen if you did use it. And this temptation becomes stronger and stronger, and the stronger it becomes, the less you can think of means to, to counteract this temptation. You will not even have the intention to continue using it. You just want to try it a little bit just to see. And all theoretical knowledge you may have. Once tried, you may not, you may not find it possible not to be swept away by it. 
dissolves under the growing weight of the temptation. And once this one spirit succumbed to this temptation, he set something in motion that he could not change anymore. Just as he had once known that it would, but did not wish to remember when he did give in. The result was not an immediate change, but a gradual one. The change from harmony to disharmony took place just as gradually and slowly as your change from disharmony into harmony. The latter is evolution. The former could be called an evolution backwards and neither can ever happen suddenly. Here I would like to give you another example that may help you understand by trying to feel when thinking of this example. Let us suppose a person is tempted to take a drug and he does not have the intention to succumb to it entirely. He too knows, as everybody does, that this would mean his ruin in every respect. But he thinks he can just try this once to see what it is like what it is like. But after this once, he cannot escape it anymore. Hmm. He is caught. And this is a mild example of what I'm trying to tell you. But the same principle reigns here. Hmm. The same principle holds true to everything opposed to divine law. This one spirit who succumbed first generated a power running in the opposite direction of divine law, but it was still the same power, only used differently. And with this power, he could affect and influence many other spirits little by little, but not all spirits. Mm. There was a division between those who succumbed and those who did not. And with the former, the so-called fall of the angels thus begun. And in this process, every divine aspect turned into this opposite nature. Harmony becomes disharmony, beauty becomes ugliness, light, darkness, wisdom, blindness, love, hatred, fear, and egotism, and the union becomes separateness. Once wholeness split further and further, the more this pull proceeded, thus evil came into existence. Yes. I have once explained that the spiritual worlds are psychological words. Excuse me. I have once explained that the spiritual worlds are psychological worlds. That does not mean, though, that they are unsubstantial and formless. For only in your material world are thoughts and feelings abstract. abstract. In other words, a spirit creates the world he lives in according to his state of mind. This state of mind automatically creates as a reflex action. A sphere consisting of landscapes, houses, objects, objects etc. Thus, only spirits of equal development can share a world. Thus, only spirits of equal development can share a world, which in certain states of development facilitates life, but therefore slows down development. When you keep in mind that your attitudes, your thoughts, your feelings, your opinions, your goals create your world, you will understand that the world of the highest spirits is beautiful and light, while the worlds of the fallen spirits becomes dark and ugly. And since the great plan has been put in operation, many worlds in between the dark and the light exist in various degrees of harmony and dis harmony according to the state of development the once fallen spirits have reached your material world is one of them most of you know that the spirit in its highest degree of development combines the male and the female aspects there is no separateness and i have also mentioned that this this at the beginning of this lecture that man and women exist on earth as separate entities is as you will readily understand now a result of the splitting hmm. Therefore, each being has its counterpart. Man urges to find the right partner is nothing else but the deep longing for reunion with the separated other part. Every being passes certain incarnations with his true double or counterpart because th through the thus resulting happiness this entails lies a duty to fulfill something and certain other incarnations have to be gone through without this counterpart in that also lies fulfillment of a different sort. However, the latter does not mean necessarily to lead a life of celibacy. There may be other partners with whom not only great happiness can be built, but with whom other duties may be fulfilled, karma is paid off, and so on. So if you pass an incarnation without your true double, but have another partner with whom you have something to fulfill, do not think that your counterpart in spirit world will be hurt or jealous because of the love you may give to your present partner. Oh no, things do not work out in this way in absolute reality. If you learn to give love, you come a step nearer to God, to your fulfillment, to your liberation, and thus also to your counterpart, no matter how you learn it. Sex, the urge for this kind of love, is in short the longing for union with your counterpart so as to become the whole again. It all depends on how you direct this force. Lower developed beings like animals, plants, and minerals are still in a state of further splitting or division. Man's state being split in half, so to speak, is the last form before reunion, as the one creature he once was can take place. I'm going to stop now because my dog won't stop barking. Um, I have a little bit more and I'm going to finish it later.